Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the oral se session. Um, it's human sensing tool. We're going to have five papers. And uh, the first paper is, I'm sorry, unsupervised geometry aware representation for 3D human pose estimation. Um, this is work by Helga Rodin, Matthew Salzman, and Pascal Foix. And Helge will give the presentation. Yeah. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm at the CV lab in, at the EPFL. And my research is about reconstructing humans. I'm interested in reconstructing the shape, the appearance, and particularly in this work, also the 3D pose which we see in the image. We have made great progress in this direction using deep learning, provided that we have enough training data. And to exemplify that, we did this experiment that we train a ResNet on the task of human pose estimation on the human 3.6M data set, so a huge data set. And here we plot the error. So on the vertical axis, you see the error, the mean distance between the predicted joint location and the true joint location. And we plot this error with respect to the training data set size. So we train this network multiple times with increasingly large data sets. And we can clearly see that the more data we have, the more accurate our method is. And the second thing that we, that we can see is that this data set seems not to be large enough. So the more data we add, it actually still gets more and more accurate. So if we would double the data set size, we would expect to get even higher accuracies. But getting this data, getting labeled data, is very expensive. It involves often some manual processing. So it's not easy to scale this app. That's why in this talk, we try to derive an unsupervised method, or a method which learns some representation in an unsupervised way to need less labels for the supervised task. So in the end, we want to end up on the bottom left of this graph, have the same accuracy as the fully supervised method, but using less labels. <clears throat> the problem is that this task of estimating the human pose from a single image is really difficult. So we have to use a deep neural network. And these deep networks, they have lots of parameters. And they're going to overfit if we only train on the small data. And yeah, to overcome this limitation, we propose a geometry-aware representation learning technique. And the key part is that we split this deep neural network into two parts. We, place, uh, we put this latent representation in the center. And now if the latent representation, if it's powerful enough, the step from latent representation to 3D, 3D pose should actually be easy. And if it's easy, we can use a simple network. It has few parameters. We can train it on a small data set and still get high accuracy. So it will make this step easier. But on the other hand, it just shifts the problem to the left. Now the problem is, how can we learn this powerful representation, which somehow encodes human pose already, how, uh, that encodes pose shape and appearance, without using a lot of labels again. That was the thing we wanted to get rid of. So we want to have an unsupervised approach that learns just by looking at images or videos. In my talk, I will go step by step through this pipeline. I will start with the unsupervised training. The canonical way of doing unsupervised training on images is obviously an outer encoder. I guess most of you are familiar with that, but let me briefly uh, explain it. An outer encoder is a neural network that learns the identity function. But it learns, to, uh, it learns an intrinsic compression because we put this bottleneck layer in the middle. We make the center of the network, we make the feature dimensions very small. So it has to learn an image compression, in a sense. But we want to reconstruct 3D pose. And this image compression, it will not represent 3D features, just image encodings. That's why we switch to multi-view data. It's a little bit more restrictive case. We not only want to learn from images and videos, but video is taken at the same time, looking at the same subject. And we also assume that we know the relative camera translation between them, so cameras are calibrated in this case. But the idea is that it's hard to get labeled data, but it's relatively easy to capture data also with two cameras. It's not too much of a hassle. OK, so how can we learn a useful representation from this multi-view data? For that, we use novel view synthesis. It's a quite well-known but promising research field. In that case, we want to, given one image, here the one on the left with the black frame, we want to map from one image to, uh, from one view to the other view. So in this case, we want to know how this uh, woman looks from the side view. And we want to train a neural network to do this. So that at test time, we can feed in a new image and synthesize novel views. Yeah, at test time, synthesize novel views. Oh, sorry, this was too quick. So at test time, we feed in a new image 
remind that this is really a monocular method. So we don't need multi-view image anymore. Just for training, for test time, we have a monocular algorithm. And we feed in the image. We feed in the angle, the view transformation we want to do. And then we can, the network learns to synthesize this new view. So there, there's quite some literature in this direction. Essentially, you can start off from an autoencoder and do two additions to that. I marked it here in green. First of all, oh, the green is not very well visible. Um, so first of all, we don't learn the identity anymore, but we learn to decode to the second view. So that's why we compare the output to camera two. And the second thing is that, well, the network can't do black magic. It, we somehow we have to tell the network that, OK, we want to see this person from a 90 degree angle, not from the opposing side. So we have to feed the camera rotation as well to this network. We did a small extension to the standard procedure. Because we are interested in modeling the human, not the background, that's why we put in the skip connection. So we estimate the background. We assume that we have static cameras. You can simply compute the background. And we feed this background to the decoding states. And that yeah, frees the network from learning the background uh, itself. It can spend all the power on the, on the foreground, on the human. So then at test time, we can actually put an arbitrary background. I will mostly put this white background because we don't care. But you can also pick an arbitrary picture like this tree and superimpose this. Because the network learned to estimate the human from the input image and superimpose it on the target texture. This is all rather standard. We had this uh, background handling as an extension. The key, part is now, the key part about this method is now this geometric aware representation that we want to learn. We have used multi-view data. But how can we really encode something three-dimensional, something which we can rotate? And that was the idea behind this. So instead of just having a, a vector of uh, unstructured variables as a latent code, we use a 3D point cloud. So we encode the image to a 3D point cloud. And then to, to tell the network to which view we want to decode, we just rotate the point cloud by the respective angle. So an expli explicit rotation of the latent code. And as you can see on the right, we can then uh, closely resemble the rotation of the decoder. <clears throat> yeah, it's again a relatively simple extension and has been used by others before for novel view synthesis. So instead of having, as I explained, we have not a single latent vector, but we have this point cloud, so a three by n dimensional latent space. And then to tell the network where to decode to, we explicitly rotate this latent space. This has been used before for novel view synthesis, but here we really explore the full potential by using it for learning a representation, which is then suitable for the task of human pose estimation and possibly also other tasks. Here in a, a short ablation study, if you are just concerned about novel view synthesis, we can compare our result in the center using this geometric encoding. And on the right, you see it without. So if you would, instead, the alternative is you just feed the rotation matrix as a parameter, and the network has to learn how to rotate. But then we overfit to the discrete camera positions we had in our training set, whereas in, uh, in the geometric case, where we explicitly rotate, we can get all these in-between views, a much more fine-grained representation. So much about the geometric encoding, but not all properties are well encoded in a 3D space that is rotated. If you think about the color of the shirt uh, shown here in the image, there's no, it make, doesn't make sense to rotate the color in 3D by the view angle. So that's why we split our representation in two. We have this geometric encoding on the bottom, but then we have a separate appearance latent space. But now the task is, how can we make the network learn the separation? How should the network learn what to encode in 3D and what in appearance? So what we use for that is that appearance is the, a time invariant property. It will not change across a video. But pose is. So pose will be time variant. That's why we pick a, a third image. Before, we were training on images taken at the same time, but from a different view. Now we pick a, an, a third image, which is from an arbitrary camera, and particularly at a different time step. Then pose is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be independent between the two. So what we do is that we take the appearance from one image and the 3D information from the lower image. And this separation enforces uh, this taking these independent time steps enforces the separation of appearance and 3D pose. We can clearly see that this helps. Here we have one subject. We encode it. We can do the novel view synthesis. Then we can take a second subject. And we can now interpolate the appearance from one to the other, or exchange the appearance. So we take the appearance from the man, 
and make the women wear the clothing of the men, or vice versa, we pose the man in the pose seen by the, by the female subject. So, so much about learning with this representation. This is really the key part. We want to, wanted to learn a representation which explicitly encodes 3D features. And then, actually, the supervised step at the end, now that we have a powerful representation, it becomes quite simple. We just use a two-layer, fully connected neural network to map from this point cloud, which doesn't have any semantic, to 3D post locations. <coughs> Here are some qualitative results. On the top, you see our approach, doing this two, two steps, first inferring the latent representation and then mapping to 3D pose. And on the bottom, you see the baseline, the ResNet, which is trained to directly predict from the image to 3D pose. And it's clearly evident that the learned representation helps the network to generalize to new poses. Interestingly, all the extensions we did to the novel view synthesis and the encoding, it helps a lot. So using the appearance separation and the background handling improves by more than a centimeter. And it's really key, as you can see in the, in the lowest row, using this geometric encoding is really crucial. This is consistent across different training data set sizes. So we will train, we, we train our method, the unsupervised part, we trained it on the whole training data set. And then the last bit, this pose estimation, we just trained on the same subsets of the, of the labels as the baseline. And as you can see here, we really succeed with much fewer labels. So our method starts working out with 500 or 2,000. 500 images, whereas the others need hundreds of thousands of images. There's a bit of work on using multi-view data to improve pose estimation. And these two works, what they do is that they use either a 2D or 3D detector, a monocular one, and then they apply it to all the views of a multi-view sequence, and they enforce them to be consistent. So that improves the performance of the initial detector, but it's still a little bound to the initial performance. You need to start from somewhere. And if it's not good enough, you will never end up with the really good results. So here we see the comparison uh, of our previous CVPR paper using this technique. It improves on the baseline, but not at, as much as this new version. You might be a little worried about this end of the graph. It actually just means that if we have as much supervised data as unlabeled data, then it doesn't help to pre-train, because anyways, you will see the same data during supervised training. And we lose a bit, a bit of performance because of this two-stage process. So you might think, OK, now the method is, is decent, but how can we improve this method? And for that, we analyzed how the method scales with the amount of unlabeled data you use. Here again, a similar experiment. We uh, subsample the unsupervised training this time, and we keep the labels fixed. And as you can see, we have this linear trend. So adding more unlabeled data will improve the accuracy of this method dramatically. We don't know exactly, but for sure it will improve more. There's a bit of future work I would like to mention. There are obviously some limitations. Currently, we have only a single person and only sparse key points. So we would like to extend it to dense pose as well. But that should only concern the last part. The representation is general. For that, yeah, please come to the poster number two. And yeah, I have some take home messages for you. What I tried here to, to do is that instead of trying to label the whole world, we try to learn from unsupervised examples. But then also, we don't try to learn everything, but where possible, we exploit geometry for doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Time for questions. Yeah, and the code is available, so feel free to play around with it. Go ahead. We have one question. Hi, over here. Uh, the graphs you were showing, the supervised results were kind of going down and looks like they were saturating around 100 or 110 millimeter. Are these uh, the best uh, kind of state-of-the-art results in the last couple of years? Because I'm just recalling from memory, I thought they were kind of saturating around 50, 60, 70 millimeters. You're, you're talking about the accuracy. Yeah. Yes, um, that's correct. So this is a very simple baseline. So it's a standard ResNet without any modification. So there are different network architecture which are known to work better f for the task. Okay. And then I would guess that all the whole graph would go down. So the baseline would be better. But our method using the same architecture should also be better. Have you evaluated that, or is that in the paper by any chance? Um, I played around with an even simpler technique with a unit, and that indeed happens. Okay. So, so it scales in that direction. And another part is that other methods use segmentation or other labels. So again, more label data, and that helps as well. Cool. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, but yeah, I agree. So to really see the value of this approach, we would have to apply it to much more unlabeled data and see where it really ends. So maybe I have one short question um, related to your last point. Like, how, how do you think like, your method generalizes to more complex appearances and backgrounds? Um, do you think you would have a network capacity problem or the latent space? Do you think like, you could encode a wide variety of appearances? Um, it's hard to say. I didn't really experiment with it because in this data set what, that we used, it's only five subjects. You can clearly see if you apply the method to a subject not seen during training, if it's a test subject, the appearance will not be matched well because it has never, never mm -hmm. seen that. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly, the pose was really, really well, well matched. And we have seen that on, on other poses. So for this task of pose estimation, it generalized quite well. But yeah, to really scale it up, I guess we, we need a bigger latent space, a bigger network. Mm -hmm. um, there's some work to do, but I think it's quite promising. OK, yeah, thanks. Let's thank the speaker again.